We'll now continue with the few notes on semiconductors and insulators. So let's come to the uh, definition of semiconductors and insulators. Those are materials that eventually contain a band gap right at the Fermi level. It means that if I look at the band structure of such material, it will of course contain energy bands, Every material contains energy bands. But unlike metals, where the Fermi level goes right through this uh, one of those bands, or a couple of them when they are overlapping, for semiconductors and insulators, this Fermi level lies directly in the band gap. So this is an energy which none of the electrons can eventually have. Uh, the Fermi level as being the chemical potential uh, of an electron that would need to be, uh, that, that would be the energy of an electron added to the system at zero Kelvin would be defined as the energy of the top of this highest occupied band, which we call the valence band. Um, it can, however, be moved when we speak about uh, either different defect levels or when we speak about uh, contact of such a material with some other materials, it can be moved uh, to pretty much any value within the band gap. There are plenty of band gaps. Look at the metal and even metal contains a band gap. But this band gap is between occupied states or between unoccupied states. Although this terminology is strictly speaking correct, whenever someone speaks about band gap, what we mean by that is the energy separation between the occupied and unoccupied states. So the band gap would be really the difference between the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied state. Band. Uh, these bands are then called the unoccupied ones as the conduction bands. The highest occupied would be called as the valence bands. You may now ask, what is the difference between semiconductor and insulator? And the answer is, it depends to whom you ask. There are people who work a lot with silicon and germanium and for them semiconductor is a material that has band gap around one one and a half 0.7 electron volt you may then ask them so what is an insulator and they tell you well insulator this is for me anything above i don't know four or five electron volts mm -hmm. so you take this as a granted and then you come to another group of people and they work with semiconducting aluminum nitride. And you ask them, what is the band gap there? They tell you, well, the band gap is around 6.5, 6.3 electron volts. You say, how is that possible? It's about five even. Well, for those people, the band gap is much larger. They often call these materials as well, wide band gap semiconductors. But what might be for some semiconductor, because the way how they use it and the applications how they use it. And they acknowledge specifically that the gap is wide. Some other people may use the same material in their application field as an insulator. An insulator essentially means that for your particular applications, the electrons will never have enough energy to be excited into the conduction band. Right, so it very much depends on the application area where you use the material. We might have a narrow band gap semiconductors. Uh, we might have wide band gap semiconductors. We might have insulators. From the point of view, how we describe them, 
from the point of view how we apply this band structure theory, those are the same type of materials essentially being described by the fact that the Fermi level lies in the band gap. A difference between metals and semiconductors or insulators, on the other hand, is with the, in the temperature dependence of the conductivity. For metals, the conductivity typically decreases with temperature, and that is because of the increased resistivity. You have to see that a conductivity is related to the excitation of an electron from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. Well, for metals, since this is essentially one band, the difference between the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied state is zero. So to excite the first electrons is terribly easy, right? You do not have to uh, excite, uh, you do not have to spend any energy on doing that. And these electrons would be just uh, mobile as hell, unless they are scattered by the moving atomic cores. So they are scattered by the phonons. And of course, we know that with increasing temperature, we have more lattice vibrations, and therefore the scattering increases with temperature. <coughs> Opposite is true uh, for semiconductors. Why? Well, at zero Kelvin or low temperatures, the electrons do not gain enough thermal kick, thermal excitation to overcome the band gap. That means the semiconductor behaves in this insulating behavior. We do not get any conduction. With increasing temperature, however, we do not only provide more and more energy that the electrons can eventually be directly excited from a top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. But even before that, because of the lattice vibrations and the interaction between electrons and lattice vibrations, an electron which is at the top of the valence band might gain additional energy, so the thermal energy, also from the kinetic energy of this phonon was a particle. That would be enough for the electron to overcome the barrier, overcome uh, the, uh, the band gap, and come to the bottom of the conduction band. That means with increasing temperature, at least at the beginning, the conductivity of semiconductors increases. The uh, semiconductors are described by the quality or by the type of their band gap. We distinguish between so-called direct and indirect band gaps. If I look at an example of a band structure of germanium that we have here, we can clearly see that the top of the conduction band, so top of the valence band, is at the gamma point. Whereas the bottom of the conduction band lies elsewhere. It's actually, uh, sorry, the lowest one is, is here, right? So it's uh, at the, uh, along the one, one, one direction in the reciprocal space. It means if I want to excite the electron from the occupied states at zero Kelvin, to the lowest possible unoccupied state at, again, the zero Kelvin, then I would take the transition corresponding to the lowest energy difference, which is from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. And this transition would yield a difference of roughly 0.9 electron volt. This means that the transition, or upon such transition, I need to change also the k vector of an electron. And since the uh, transitions must follow 
So whenever an electron interacts with some source, is scattered and so on, we must not only fulfill the energy conservation law, but also the momentum conservation law. For such excitation, we would need a scatter that brings also the momentum that has non-zero momentum. Therefore, for exciting an electron from here to here, we need, let's say, we cannot work only with photons, which do not have any momentum. We need to have typically photo, uh, phonons, so lattice vibrations, or some other uh, quasi-particles that contain or that, that bring alongside the momentum as well. Right, so we say when we want to excite the electron uh, by photon, we need to go upwards. So we cannot change the k vector of the electron. And then we are searching for the smallest direct gap. We end up saying that this smallest direct gap is at the gamma point, but it is larger than the indirect band gap. So we will be distinguishing between semiconductors that are direct or indirect. Indirect semiconductors are those which have the indirect band gap or for which an indirect band gap exists, which is smaller than a direct band gap. And the direct one is the smallest difference between the valence band and the conduction band for the same k vector. <clears throat> what we have on the right hand side is a real band structure of germanium. On the left hand side, we have a schematic picture. And we again see that the description with the parabolas is very useful here. The shapes of the bands are complex, but near to the center of the gamma, uh, of the Brillouin zone, as well as at the Brillouin zone boundaries, we see that all those bands can be fairly well approximated by parabolas. So in this schematic picture on the left-hand side, we have the schematic parabolic representation of the bands from the germanium. We then distinguish between two different behaviors of electrons, uh, sorry, of holes that we have there. So whenever we would have electrons that are described by states from this branch of the dispersion relationship, since they are on a branch with high curvature. The corresponding mass is uh, small. Once again, the uh, effective mass is proportional to the curvature inverse. So we call the holes on this band as light holes. The term light reflects their small effective mass. On the other hand, those broad band of uh, holes near to the top of the valence band, these would be termed heavy holes. When we include also a spin orbit coupling, which we haven't discussed yet, and we will touch this later on magnetism, we get later on splitting of some of these uh, uh, key states that we have in, in germanium. And depending on their, uh, on their uh, magnetic state and the other quantum numbers, we get a further splitting of the P states. There will be the three half states, which uh, correspond to these light and heavy holes, and the one half states, which then yield the uh, 
top of the band energy is slightly smaller than the real top of the occupied valence band. Those are some split off holes. <clears throat> In many publications, you might find the definition that the white band gap semiconductors would be significantly larger than one electron volt and typically larger than three electron volts. So as a examples from my personal experience um, of wide band gap semiconductors, we talk about the hexagonal gallium nitride the material being used for light emitting diodes and the, uh, the aluminum nitride, which I've already mentioned with the band gap over six electron volts. Gallium nitride has a band gap around 3.6 electron volts. We live in silicon age, silicon era, and so we need to also discuss very briefly the uh, band structure of silicon. Silicon is similar to germanium, an indirect band gap semiconductor, which we can clearly see from the fact that the lowest difference between the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band is realized for a transition which changes the K vector. The transition here is corresponding to roughly 1.1 electron volt. So this is the uh, indirect band gap of, semicond oh, of silicon. The direct band gaps are much larger, as we can see here, depending on the state where we are, around four to five electron volts. Um, what we can further see from here is the Fermi surface, we can discuss what states will have the first conducting electrons, which of course is then um, saying something about, for example, the anisotropicity of your uh, tensor of conductivity, of electric conductivity. The conduction electrons, conducting electrons, so the minimum of the conduction band is, relate, is, is uh, located along the gamma to 100 direction, but not quite at the Brillouin zone boundary. So it is somewhere on the way there. And that is what we see when we present the 3D uh, Brillouin zone. When we depict it here, we get that these conducting electrons would be located along the 100 directions. And the first conducting electron, so the really bottom of the conduction band, is located not at the Brillouin zone boundary, but still inside of the first Brillouin zone boundary. If we compare the same story with the band structure of germanium, which we discussed before. And there we said that the minimum of the conduction band was located at the 111 direction, at the actually 111 uh, point at the Brillouin zone boundary. Then the conduction or the conducting electrons would be having a different K vectors, different K states. They are also this uh, minima of the conduction band, so the Fermi surface would be shared between neighboring um, between neighboring Brillouin zones. Nevertheless, in both cases, the Fermi surfaces are localized, and so the conductivity is bad of these materials. Of course, they are semiconductors. What we clearly see from here is that the anisotropy of the resistivity tensor or conductivity tensor, electric conductivity tensor will be different. 
So this is something that we have spoken about already before, that for, for excitations, when we want to excite an electron from a top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band, we need to provide an energy. If we only provide an energy, but we do not provide any possibility to change the momentum, we are uh, doing so-called direct excitations and we are probing those typically with photons. These are then optical transitions and what we get from such uh, transitions is the optical band gap. Optical band gap is the lowest energy difference between the top of the valence band, or sorry, between, right, right, between the valence band and the conduction band for a direct transition. If we provide less energy than this band gap, this energy cannot be used for exciting an electron. So we will get that uh, the complete, uh, uh, that, that no, none of these photons with small energy are absorbed by the electrons. There might be other mechanisms which absorb these uh, uh, photons, but not the electrons. So there we see that the absorption coefficient is essentially going to zero. And for zero Kelvin, where this would be absolutely true, the uh, edge of the absorption would be indeed our optical, uh, optical band gap, which we estimated from the band structure to be around uh, 1.1 1 .1 electron volt, if I'm not mistaken, so it would be further here. When we are now at the finer temperature, where the excitation of these photons, which bring the energy, can be further assisted by phonons, which provide the kick, which provide the change of the, um, uh, the momentum, then we can start exciting the electrons, even for lower energies of the uh, of the uh, of the photons. So with increasing temperature, where we have more and more phonons available, more and more lattice vibrations that provide the uh, momentum for the electron, um, we are then able to observe absorption, optical absorption, even for lower energies then what is the direct, uh, uh, the, the direct gap? And so this will be then probing, uh, in principle, the combination of the indirect band gap, so the smallest electronic band gap, together with the uh, phonon dispersion relationship. So please distinguish between optical band gap which is the smallest direct band gap and the electronic band gap, which is uh, the indirect band gap. In the case that optical and electronic band gaps are the same, then we are in the situation when we describe a direct band gap semiconductor. And the final note, what I have here is uh, really, just, just a note about what we can do with the semiconductors. We can uh, try to improve the possibility that electrons recombine where we want them. So the excited electrons, which then want to come back to the valence state and thereby they emit some energy, they emit probably a photon again, um, they, uh, they do this uh, with a, a controlled spatial distribution and uh, also increased efficiency. The problem that we have is that we have holes, that means the empty, uh, empty 
states for uh, the final state of an electron. And we have the excited electrons, both of them with different momentum. This is because we have an indirect semiconductor. We, however, want to increase the probability for such de-excitation to happen. What we can do is uh, to call for help the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which says that the uncertainty in position times the uncertainty in momentum is always larger than h bar half. If we thereby make the uncertainty in position extremely small, this uncertainty principle implies that we cannot localize in the momentum space the electron very well. By which, especially confining the electron, we will delocalize it in the momentum space and eventually it will also have with non-zero probability the momentum which is identical to the momentum of the of the whole the, the excitation can happen simply as a consequence of this uncertainty principle and such the excitation is related to the emission of a photon once again because at that state the probability of an electron having the same momentum as the empty hole, so the empty state in the, in the valence band, uh, the probability is uh, increased by the spatial confinement. This principle is used for developing or designing the semiconducting devices, which are typically a layered devices, layered uh, materials with different uh, semiconducting uh, or, or based on the of different semiconductors with different band gaps, different alignment of bands. Uh, for more advanced materials, we might have not only layered materials, layered structures, but we might have even uh, three dimensional confinements. You have probably heard not only about quantum wells, but very popular these days, quantum dots. So in quantum dots, the confinement is not only one dimensional but it's essentially two-dimensional or three-dimensional, depending on how you do that. So quantum rods would be two-dimensional and quantum dots are three-dimensional confinement of electrons. <clears throat> the confinement on, of, the, of the electrons has, uh, when we have the different materials, has uh, also a huge consequence of the increased transition, as I have mentioned already before. Uh, the electrons in the conduction band, they tend to agglomerate in the spaces where they would lower their energy. So we see in this case, when this is the band corresponding to the conduction band, I have electrons in there and these electrons will tend to uh, accumulate, spatially accumulate in the range uh, or in the region where they can lower their total energy, where they are in the bot at the bottom of the conduction. The holes as positively charged particles, on the other hand, tend to accumulate at the top of the valence band. You can imagine the holes really as bubbles under the water, they would always tend to go uh, to, to the top of your, of your cavity. Now, if you have a typical hetero, uh, 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 homojunction, meaning that you join P and N type materials, that means that the bottom of your conduction band and the top of your valence band are spatially delocalized you will end up with a situation that the electrons are not spatially available at the places where the holes, the states for their delocalization are available. And the 
uh, efficiency of such the excitation process is going to be not very large. On the other hand, if you make the uh, heterojunction, meaning that you have really also a spatial confinement of a material with different band gap, for example, sandwiched between other semiconducting materials, both holes and electrons will be spatially confined. And again, this will contribute to the increased probability of the um, transition to happen. That the electrons can be de-excited into the available empty space at the top of the valence band. And I think this is the last slide exactly I have here, is that what you can do with these uh, uh, semiconductors when you are really uh, designing a device is that you try to play with many different parameters. And uh, why many of these semiconducting alloys have complex chemistries, and the one that I'm most familiar with are the hexagonal uh, gallium nitride based materials. If you alloy aluminum or indium into gallium nitride, you can tune the band gap. Aluminum nitride towards higher values, indium nitride towards lower values. Means it allows you to cross from uh, ultraviolet gallium nitride band gap towards visible spectrum upon alloying indium nitride. What you do, however, with the alloying of those elements is that you also change the crystal structure. You do not luckily change the crystal structure in terms of the, uh, of the symmetry. You remain in the hexagonal region, but you are changing the lattice parameter. Now, all those materials, they have to be of a great crystalline quality because all defects are bad guys. They introduce unwanted uh, non-radiative non, uh, defect states in the band gap and so on. So we want to have really single crystalline layers. When we deposit those, we need to have them matched on a certain substrate. This was actually the biggest killer for gallium nitride because there is no naturally matching substrate on which gallium nitride can be grown. If you, however, add indium nitride and at the same time also aluminium nitride into gallium, you can tune both parameters almost independently within a certain playground, of course. You can tune the band gap to the value you want for your application to have an emitter with a certain wavelength. And at the same time, you can get a different lattice parameters of your final material. Again, to probably better match your substrate, to increase the epitaxial relationship, to decrease the um, the strain coming from the, from the growth process, which at the end of the day also influences the band gap of these semiconductors. This independent game between band gap, so the semiconducting properties, the lattice parameter, and the overall geometry of device, this is called band gap engineering. With this, I'm at the end of this uh, excursus to real materials. We have uh, spoken about the technologically most important semiconductor nowadays, the silicon, which we saw is an indirect band gap semiconductor. We discussed the differences in direct and indirect band gaps on the band structure of germanium which is a semiconductor with smaller indirect band gap than silicon, but uh, with the same crystalline structure, also the diamond structure. We linked the direct and indirect band gaps uh, to the optical properties, the adsorption uh, measured, and the temperature dependence of the adsorption coefficient for light adsorption. And at the end of, the, of this uh, part of the lecture, we discussed the geometry, 
and the chemistry of semiconducting materials, how they can be arranged to lead to so-called quantum wells, quantum rods, or quantum dots, um, and thereby increase the efficiency of the transition uh, based on the un un uncertainty principle, which increases the probability of even states that do not have nominally matching momentum to actually increase the probability of uh, their delocalization in the reciprocal space by their confinement in the real space, and therefore increase the probability of a light emission from such 